Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship, whether you're joining us here or online, and pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will uh, move us and bring us together to that experience of the power of God. Today, we are continuing uh, the sermon series dealing with this question, can you believe in God, love Jesus, and use your brain at the same time? Uh, so the sermon series is based on uh, the title of this book, Finding God in the Waves. And uh, the idea is by, it's by Mike McCarg, and the idea behind this is, is to look at those uh, disconnects and how sometimes people think, if I believe in science, I can't believe the Bible uh, literally, or I, if I believe the Bible, I can't believe in science. And so hopefully through this series, we'll explore those difficult <coughs> challenges sometimes and I really think they're more cultural because in other cultures there's not this um, tension. It's more of a Western mind piece. Uh, people in other cultures don't look at the Bible in the same way. And so hopefully uh, we're asking these, this question with the intention of opening up more to God. Uh, so uh, today the focus is being on being open what does it mean to be open uh, and letting our faith stay alive instead of being filled with uh, fear that it has to be rigid? Of course, in religion, it's always hard because you feel like faith, you know, you have to define certain beliefs, but unfortunately, people think these are set forever and ever and cannot be ever changed or grow in our understanding of those. So science, I believe, can help us because one of the uh, ideas behind science is that it helps you stay open <coughs> to new learnings. And interesting, I was talking to someone this past week and I don't watch Jeopardy, rarely do I watch Jeopardy, but I guess they have a new segment, Bible and Science, or Science and the Bible. And so we're gonna watch a little piece on that. Welcome back. It's the first time we are featuring science and the Bible on Jeopardy. Let's take a look at the clue. A 2021 study suggested that an asteroid that struck the Jordan Valley circa 1650 BC gave rise to the story of this city in Genesis 19. You have 30 seconds. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> begin with our returning champ, Brian Ahern. What was your response? What is Babel? That is not correct. And how much did you wager? 6,200, that'll take you down to zero. Lee Jonig, what was your response? Sodom. What is, it looked like the Great Flood. It, it became Sodom. That is correct. Stones and fire fell from the sky just as fire and brimstone destroyed the wicked city of Sodom. How much did you wager? 16,000, that gives you 32,000. It all comes down to you, Robert Wan. Did you come up with Sodom? You did, and how much are we gonna add to your score? 8,301, which gives you $32,001. <laughs> Congratulations, Robert Juan. By $1, you are our Jeopardy champion. Terrific game. Well, Robert will be back with us on Monday. We hope you'll join us. I just thought that was really good, F for one thing. But how many of you guessed this city correctly? A couple of you, okay, all right, all right. Uh, and it's interesting what, what was done there. You see how a story is in the Bible and somebody uses the science to say, oh, well, something happened around that time. Sometimes we hear that with uh, the great flood. Uh, you know, there was, there was something that happened and people reacted to it and there is, and so the stories are based on real life uh, events. But, of course, there's always the danger is to use, you know, like we gotta prove everything scientifically in the Bible and of course that's not the intention 
of, of the Bible. The Bible is a book of faith. So hopefully in science, as we look at how science is open, today we're looking at the question of is faith social conditioning? I would say yes, it is, because if you grew up in a Jewish home, most likely you'd become Jewish. If you grew up in a Muslim home, you'd be Muslim. If you grew up in a Baptist home, you'd become Baptist. I mean, we change uh, throughout life, but a lot of times th we are conditioned by our parents. The hope is that we don't get stuck there. The hope is that we're, our faith is always growing, always open to new revelations. So I'm gonna invite us to pray with uh, together. Take a deep breath and allow the Holy Spirit to open your hearts today to this moment, this moment of God's grace, of being in this time and being present to one another. God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift of coming together as your people. Oh, we thank you for guiding us and bringing us to this moment of grace when we open our hearts intentionally to you. God, we pray for our world where there is strife, there's injustice, there's hate, that we may work for peace. We pray for ourselves today as we open our hearts to you in this moment of grace that we may experience the power of your transformation in each of our lives. Wherever there is brokenness, bring us healing. Wherever there is rigidity, help us to open to your ways of grace. Help us to see this world as you see it. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world. We pray this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Throne to the manger, from a manger 
So today we're looking at this theme of social conditioning and how sometimes faith becomes this rigid uh, way of looking at things. So I want to share with you that science could become a model for us of how to keep things going. I mean, it's the same, it works in a lot of uh, different principles in life. As long as we're able to stay open, we are, uh, I think we're able to grow. Once you start saying, well, I can't do this, or I won't believe that, or I won't listen to anything new, then the door is closed. And so the, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been, of course, you've been alive in this, but you've uh, <coughs> thought of the, all the attacks on science, especially in our country. With the pandemic, uh, there's been this whole debate where, okay, is COVID real? Uh, is, uh, is the vaccine bad for us? And all these different questions that really worked at the heart of this issue of trusting science. And of course, there's always the thing of saying, you know, well, science said this, but then it, you know, things were not correct. And so I saw, uh, I saw this meme and I really, I thought it was, it spoke uh, really greatly to this piece, so it's, it's the next slide. Um, sorry, I can't really control this. So I wanna get it right. All right, science is not is not the truth. Science is finding the truth. When science changes its opinion, it didn't lie to you, it learned more. I really thought this was, you know, of course some people would think that's sarcastic, but really the idea is to uh, stay in that focus to say, you know, doctors sometimes don't know about a disease and we've had that in the past. How many, I mean, I have an uncle who died of pneumonia. He was 36 years old. He, at, at that time, this was back in the olden days, uh, where penicillin was not readily available in Syria. It, it was just beginning to be in Europe. To, and so they didn't get it in time for him. And he died at an early age from pneumonia. Now think about that. Uh, today, we, wouldn't, we would think, you know, what did, why did they not know about um, antibiotics? They literally just didn't know. And that's the idea, is that sometimes the same is true of faith. Uh, if you look back at church history, uh, some of the controversies that were so important, now we laugh at them and think, you know, what were they thinking? What was that about? Why did, were they so upset about this kind of stuff? Of course, now we know differently. And so today I want to uh, share with you from this book called Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. It's a story, uh, this book is by John Philip Newell. It's, this is the story of uh, Alex Alexander, uh, John Scott, and he was a Scotsman. And this was uh, a big controversy at, in the church. He was 26 years old, a minister in the Presbyterian Church, Church of Scotland, uh, that who challenged, he wouldn't sign on the Westminster Confession. Uh, it's, by the way, it's one, of, uh, it's one of the confessions in the Book of Confessions for the Presbyterian Church. His objection was that it talks about humanity being born, people being born sinful. That this just, that's how we are. We're sinful, 
This sin is who we are. Now you may think it's what's the big deal and all of that, but for him, being a, a Celt, he believed in the goodness of God's creation. So the way he read the stories of Genesis, he saw that God created everything good. Now it doesn't mean that we don't have uh, sin, we don't sin later in life, it's just we're not born sinful. So he couldn't, he couldn't with good conscience uh, sign on this confession. Of course, the authorities put him to trial. They said, well, you can't teach this stuff. This is not okay. You can't be a minister in the church. And so they put him on trial for not wanting to sign this because he, he had this, he had several beautiful images. And, and in this book, um, John Philip Newell tries to highlight a lot of these uh, themes that he was trying to describe. He talked about uh, the image of a golden thread in a garment. And this was back in the day when they, they still did that for royalty. Uh, so they uh, used a golden thread in uh, the clothing for the royalty. And he said, this, that's how we are. We have this golden thread running through our lives. Even though we may, it may not look like it, the image of God is still in us. It's never taken away. And then he <coughs> talked about this image of, uh, from botany, thinking uh, if you have a plant that gets a, the blight, you don't think you know, uh, the blight is gonna be taking away the nature of the plant. You don't define the plant. If it's a tomato plant, that's what I'm dealing with right now. I have a little uh, tomato plant that's looking really very sad. And um, it's, I don't say, it, you know, it's a blight plant. No, it's a tomato plant. It's got some disease. So you don't define the plant by the disease. And so he really struggled with that. But can you imagine at 26 years old, they had to silence him. And that's not new for the church. I and mean, it could be in any church where you, know, you have to sign on the dotted line. If you don't exactly agree with everything that's being said, then you must be a heretic. Or you must not be part of this group because religion tends to be uh, oftentimes rigid about boundaries and what we're doing. And so the problem with that, of course, is that, and I'm not trying to bash any church you know, in the, in the past because it's, of course, easy for me to stand here in the tw you know, 21st century and look back and think, oh, what were they thinking in the 19th century? Uh, it's, it's because that's gonna happen, I'm sure, to us. You know, in a couple of centuries, people will be looking back on, uh, at us and saying, what were they thinking? It's easy to see things like in hindsight, of course, when it's, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years, but it's harder when we're living in it to stay uh, true to the premise of being open to the spirit working in us. How do we stay open? And today we're looking at the example of uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's a great, of course, it's a very dramatic story, his story of conversion. Uh, and it's, it, he was conditioned from an early age to be a good, faithful Jew. Now, for him, as he grew up and became a leader, that meant you know, persecuting anyone who challenged the authority of what was uh, the, the norm. And so he believed in his heart what he was doing by persecuting the followers of Jesus. He was doing the right thing. He wasn't doing it out of an evil motivation. I am just waking up in the morning and thinking, how do I go and persecute people? He was thinking, I got to defend the true faith. That's what others were doing. And that's exactly what he was doing. So he was one of those people that was so convinced that his religious group was absolutely right. But that meant persecuting people. Now think about the contradiction, of course, in, in that statement, that you are so committed to the way of your faith that you become blind to the hate that the faith might be teaching. And so he, uh, on the way to Damascus, he was going to persecute people. And so we're going to watch a video uh, to see, um, I, I know you know the story, but it's, it's one of those great um, moments to remember. And of course, I personally love this story because it happens on the way to Damascus. 
During the first century, when the Romans ruled the known world, a grassroots countercultural movement was born in the eastern end of the empire. Yeah, it started among the Jewish people. Who for centuries now have been scattered around the known world. But no matter where they lived or what language they spoke, they kept their identity as the family of Abraham, devoted to the one true God. And every year, they would travel to Jerusalem for sacred festivals. And during one of these, the Feast of Pentecost, the visitors encountered a group of Jews who could somehow speak in everyone's native dialect. Yeah, they were telling stories about a man named Jesus who had been executed by the Romans. They claimed he had risen from the dead and was now exalted as the true king of Israel and the whole world. And this Jesus was now calling people to adopt his upside down set of values and live under his rule called the kingdom of God. And thousands of Jews decided to stay in Jerusalem and join the movement. It grew in size and in influence and gained favor with people. But not with the Jerusalem temple leaders. They viewed this whole thing as a dangerous religious sect, and they even executed one of its leaders named Stephen. It's no longer safe in Jerusalem, and so most of the followers flee for the outlying land called Judea. And you might think that's the end of the story, but actually this tragedy became the way the movement spread outside Jerusalem. That's where the second part of the book of Acts begins. The scattered followers end up in surprising places, like Samaria, where their ancient enemies live. Yeah, and Luke shows us how all of these unexpected people start following Jesus, like a sorcerer from Samaria who has to learn that the way of Jesus isn't about gaining power, but giving it up to serve others. There's also a story about an Ethiopian delegate who, after discussing the scroll of the prophet Isaiah with Philip, decides to join the movement. Yeah, Jesus is expanding his movement out into Judea and Samaria, just like he said he would. Which is great. But back in Jerusalem, we meet Saul of Tarsus. He's part of the religious elite who oppose the new movement, and he's finding and arresting Jesus' followers anywhere he can. This is a cruel guy. But think about it from his perspective. In the past, Israel had turned away to other gods and to false prophets, leading to disaster. He believed he was protecting Israel and God's honor by getting rid of these people. And then Saul hears that the movement spread north to Damascus. So he sets out there to find and arrest more followers. And on the way, Saul has this sudden encounter with the risen Jesus himself. Jesus asked Saul why he's fighting against him. And then Jesus commissioned Saul to now represent him to Israel and to the nations. And Saul is stunned and speechless. And so he ends up in Damascus, but now he's announcing the good news about the Jesus he had just been attacking. And no one saw this coming. Totally. And Totally. So, the uh, I'm not sure how. It, oh, okay. Uh, one of the pieces about the story that doesn't is not mentioned here is that a couple of chapters before, chapter seven uh, in the book of Acts, it tells us that Saul, at that time, uh, he, he's the guy represented here in this uh, icon, sitting there guarding the garments, uh, the cloaks of the people who were stoning Stephen. Stephen was one of the first uh, followers, the deacon. Uh, he was the first martyr in the church. So here he is, Stephen, just for speaking up and sharing about the way of Jesus, he's being stoned. And Saul is sitting there guarding the garments of those who are stoning him. So it tells you that Saul had really, it, 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 they wanted to tell us, the author is trying to show us, see, this is the guy. This is the guy, and it kind of gives you a, a big uh, clue of how, uh, what happened to him. So how does God get through to someone who is so complicit in hate, in a hate crime, and who is so convinced that he has the full truth? How does God get through to people like that? How does God get through to us when we're in that place? So I'm not putting myself above, because there are times when I'm like, okay, God, all right, got it, got it, thank you, I hear you. But what happened is, of course, this, this uh, dramatic story of conversion. Paul had to lose his sight. Now, again, in the Gospels, everything is, or in, in the Scriptures, this, uh, really, the sight is a big deal. When someone loses their sight, it's, it's very symbolic. Uh, because Paul was blind to seeing that the way of Jesus was a way of love. Now, he, sometimes we get confused because we have time that had passed between us and the time of these events. 
that we think this is you know, a, a Jew attacking the Christians, but really it, it's a Jew attacking other Jews because the Christians at that time were not Christians. They were followers of Jesus and they were part of the Jewish faith. And they were seeing it as just like another teaching, not, you know, th th it was common to have teachers at the time. So, so he physically had to lose his sight. And then the worst part is that he had to go to the house of a man that would have been considered his enemy. And that man uh, had to host him. And then Ananias had to also come and help him, teach him. So let's listen to the scripture itself. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest uh, and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, this is what the early Christian movement was called, the way, followers of the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, oh, saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But you get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Okay, this crashed, so I'm going to have to continue elsewhere. This is so what verse was I on? Three. Oh, wow. Only three. We have a few more verses to go to. All right. Six. Then men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate or, nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, uh, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, this is the part, of course, where, like, Lord, what are you asking? But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an, an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus." So it's a great story of rescue, if you will, kind of like what uh, Sherry sang about. This is a guy who has who lost his way. And he wasn't alone. He was part of a movement, which makes it harder uh, because once you see yourself, oh, well, others are doing it. This must be right. Uh, but the way of love was pursuing him because I believe that Saul had a spiritual life. This was probably not the first time he, he prayed fervently. Uh, most likely, if he was trained in the Jewish faith, he knew how to pray. He knew about surrendering his will to God but he was in a bad, stuck place, and it was hurting other people. So God sends this incredible vision for this man. And then imagine if this didn't happen for Saul. I mean, we would have most of the New Testament wouldn't exist because he's written so many letters. He's done so much for the church. He was the missionary, and he was the one that really pushed the church to go out into the world. So it's interesting from a close-minded guy that was so adamant about 
keeping the faith the way it was and protecting from idolatry and whatever he was afraid of to a guy that kept expanding and expanding and inviting the church to keep the doors open, to keep their hearts open to new revelation. It's, it's, it's a remarkable story, and it's really a, a testimony to what faith is about. When we look at this whole social conditioning, we get socially conditioned to have faith or to believe certain ways, but there is a danger there. Of course we want to teach our children about faith. Of course it's important to tell the stories of faith, but there's always the danger to believe that what we believe is always going to be true. What's gonna always be true is our relationship with God. That's, that's the heart of faith, the experience of the Holy Spirit. That's what you can rely on. And to keep the door open to say, you know, this is what we know today. This is how we believe today. And that's one of the things in, even when the conf book of confessions, a couple of years ago, there was uh, another confession that got added to it. Uh, because it spoke to our time, it came uh, from South Africa, the experience of uh, the church there with the apartheid, and it spoke to a different moment in time. So you can't just say, well, this is the only confession of faith, and that's it, done forever and ever. How does it work for us today? What are the issues? How is God speaking to us about the challenges in our own personal lives? How do you stay open? How do you guard your heart? from becoming uh, fear-filled or hate-filled in the name of God. And so I, I uh, wanna share a quote from Mike McCarg. He says, our Western, cultures, uh, our Western culture wants a clear winner, and a lot of this has to do with our neurological craving for certainty. My prefrontal cortex wants me to believe that it is in control that through, uh, through it, I'm making rational decisions based on an objective assessment of reality. That's a laughable statement when you think about it. Who, who of us can really say, I can see reality objectively? How? You can't. You have this body, you have this experience, you were born in this place, you were uh, raised by this family. It's like there's no way. I don't care how wonderful, loving we are. It's, we are conditioned, it's our uh, growing up, and to be humble about it, to know, yes, I only have this piece of the truth. And that's why I need others, and that's why the diversity of our uh, community is so important. This illusion is great for helping me sift through the overwhelming amount of information that is reality, but it is an oversimplified picture of what's really going on. Contrary to what we may feel, we humans were designed to find truth or objective reality. That kills us. How many of us like to think, what do you mean I'm not gonna ever have the truth? I wanna have the truth, I wanna know the truth. Um, what is it that they make you swear in court? Tell the truth and nothing but the truth? And so it's like, so help me God. <laughs> That's a very important part because you know, like. Even our recollections of, of events. Have you been around people when they're trying to remember events and they tell you a very different version of what you remember? And you're like, what do you mean? And sometimes we have faulty memories ourselves. I mean, most of the time, if, if an event, especially if it's not that important, we don't remember the details. Our brain can't handle that much information to be stored for every event, unless you have like some supernatural power. That ma matters a lot if you're someone who's trying to reconcile your inner Christian with a part of you that feels skepticism and wants hard proof for the things you believe. And so knowing that you know we're a mix of faith, doubt, uh, sometimes faults, to be humble before God, to be uh, people that are able to move from that place of certainty to the place of God's grace. And so uh, I want to share with you today, I've, I've been uh, thinking of this and how, how, what would help us stay open. And uh, there is, and I'm, I'm not into martial arts, I just read about martial arts. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like football, like, well, or today, those of us who are going to baseball, it's gonna be fun looking at you and talking to you. 
but it's not going to be, I have no idea what goes on with a baseball. I cannot get my brain to really understand certain things. And it's just probably lack of interest. I always lose it. What is an inning and how does it work? But same here. But it's a beautiful image I've uh, learned about from uh, someone who is teaching uh, prayer or uh, finding uh, the practice of soft eyes. And I guess it's a, it's an idea, again, you're, when you have somebody you're trying to uh, combat or fight against, instead of just hitting that person head on, you relax your eyes and you start seeing what's going around them. So if you pay attention, and uh, so you're, you're looking, what is that? Force. The force, yes, you start seeing. So when, if you take it figuratively, if somebody's coming at you saying, you know, there's an accusation that you're like doing this or this or that, or, you know, we never have that, of course. But if you have a confrontation with someone in your life, uh, instead of head on, pay attention, what's going on with them? What's, you know, if you have the soft eyes, what's going on? Or with yourself, if you're having a visceral reaction to something, were you really moving into that space of hate? So what's going on? What's going on with me? Because if somebody, you know, like I get sometimes that way at home, you know, why did you put the plates here? That's not where the plates belong. And I find myself so angry. I'm like, what? Over the plates? Who cares? Uh, but there's something else going on. And when you learn to have, keep those soft eyes, you realize it's not about where the plates are. It's about my need for control, my need for things to be in order. I have issues like that. And it's okay to recognize uh, what, what's really going on inside of us. So we're going to take a, just a moment to try to practice this soft eyes stuff. So I want to invite you to just relax your eyes. Instead of looking directly at one thing, which is pretty hard because that's what we, you can, you can even do it in your mind's eye and, and close your eyes. But just become aware of what's going on around you. And if you want to do it inside of your head uh, while you're thinking about an issue, take a moment um, and think about what is this uh, peace that is emerging for you, seeing around you, what is going on? What control do we need to let go of? How do we stay open to seeing the larger picture? close this with prayer. God, we thank you for the opportunity to keep our hold on life and truth light, to stay open to new revelations from you, to ways of seeing the world with more loving eyes, to seeing others as your children. Help us to let go of the social conditioning that keeps us locked into our own views to connect with you, to reach out with love, to see this gift of life as a gift of growth, of continual letting go, until we finally get to that place where we do the ultimate letting go, where we trust you fully. Amen. So I want to ask you if any of you would like to share any reactions, thoughts, and then I have just one last quote to share with you. Does this? Yes. Just one. Just. We made a little progress in our church. When we have ordained as a teaching elder. Right. You're no longer required to say you believe the full book of confession. Hey, hey. You are now required to say you believe the essential tenets, tenets of the faith. Okay, yes. So this is a new change. 
uh, as of when was it? June, I want to say it recently, uh, that in the Presbyterian Church, we just said you don't need to believe everything in the Book of Confessions, which used to be held against pastors. If you questioned any of this stuff, whoop, you're really, you could be persecuted by the church. So now we just have to say you believe in the essential tenets. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're making progress by the grace of God to say, you know, what if, you're, what if you do have a problem with uh, the teachings of original sin? Um, how could you, you know, to say, you know, you're born sinner. And knowing that teaching didn't happen until the fourth century, the fourth century. Early Christians didn't believe in that. So, and then it became the litmus test for a lot of pastors. Any other thoughts? Yes. So I have this close friend, and um, he's very spiritual as well, but much more from the Bible. Bible mm -hmm. this must be lit. Oh, yes. Right. I'm giving him advice in my head that he's taking. Right. I don't know how to soften my eyes. How to soften your eyes. Well, I know how to do it. Yes, and yes. Do it. You don't want to do it because, you know, he's saying stuff that's aggravating you. There's gold there, you know, and that's the stuff where somebody is coming at you saying, you know, you got to believe a certain way and it has to be this way. And your body is saying, no, I don't believe this way. Leave me alone. But how do we stay in relationship? But you're doing the same thing to each other because you could be on, on opposite sides but doing the same hateful thing to each other. But coming together and really sharing more deeply. I have somebody in my life, close family member, who tends to be very rigid and everything, you know, I'll often asks you know, family members, do you know beyond, beyond the shadow of doubt that you are saved and you are going to heaven? I have no idea, that's God's work. But it's hard being with him because he's always like trying to tell us how to believe and, uh, and I've learned to ask him to tell me about his experiences of God and, and they're beautiful. He has really deep spiritual experiences. So we, we try to focus on that, keeping my eyes soft. Anything else? No? We're good? Okay. So the last quote is, I uh, found this, this uh, Native American indigenous writing uh, person. He's on, his name is Stephen Charleston, and he's on Facebook. Every day he has these uh, little sayings. I love them. Uh, they're just really very meaningful. So I've been recently reading, whenever the world is spinning out of control, he comes from a very deep place of prayer and shares these pieces. And this, this is from this week, so I'm sharing it with you. The mystery will not be solved. The power of the mystery will not be denied. For the transcendent presence of the holy surrounds us, will always surround us, and the greatness of the spirit will endure forever. Be not afraid or anxious. The threshold on which you stand is the mystery of an infinite love and an intimate love, a love that beckons you into this its peace, that welcomes you with a limitless compassion. Be not afraid or anxious. Close your eyes, open your heart, and you will know what I mean. Amen. Please join us for our closing song.
desert You are the river that turns To find me you to turn to one another. You received a Bible verse from Romans 11, uh, 33. These are the wor words of the Apostle Paul to the church uh, in Rome. And so it is an invitation to turn and say these words, O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are God's judgments and how unscrutable God's ways. So turn to one another and bless one another with the peace of Christ after that. 